Hi, everyone. It's Amanda from AI for Education, and I'm so excited to be here today with Vera Cabrera, who is an amazing colleague and a leading light in AI policy and guidance, especially in the work that is just about to publish in North Carolina. So I just want to say thank you so much for joining me, Vera. Um, we're going to be today talking about the fourth state, just after Arkansas, that has put out guidance on AI adoption in the schools. And so what we're going to do about today is if you're a decision maker, if you are a teacher, or if you are someone thinking through policy, we're going to kind of walk through how we how the the document, the, the synthesis of it, how it's worked, and then what is actually in the document, and then how to think about socializing like this work, and then also potentially how you can socialize it if you're thinking about building it at your state or school district level. So first I wanna say hello, and would you mind introducing yourself? Not at all, my name is Vera Cabero, and I work for the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. I'm a veteran educator, um, longtime AI enthusiast, and so um, of course the last year has been very interesting. <laughs> Yes, it has. I like that understatement. It's like just deadpan. It's been kind of an interesting year with AI. And so when you think about, um, you know, you started from the classroom, you become an instructional coach. What made you want to really like, you really spearheaded this within the the state. So like what made you believe that this was important for North Carolina to come together on? Well, um, we do a, a road show in the summer. We call it NC Bowl, but we go from district from, we do each of the eight regions and we do training. And um, I had already been digging into it a lot and kind of realized how powerful it could be in the classroom. And then just talking to some other folks in education, realized that a lot of people really, you know, were not as enthused or as, uh, of course, I'm kind of nerdy, so I got into it right away. But a lot of people really hadn't and they really didn't know what it is. And I know as an educator, too, how hard the job is. And so I began to realize real quickly how much this could relieve the teacher's burden and so I put together a bunch of sessions for our summer NC Bold tour, and I did 24 sessions in two weeks, and they were all just very well attended. Um, and they were the most successful sessions I've done in 12 years of leading professional development. Teachers were just so appreciative. But I also come to realize through that, that a lot of them, you know, A, a lot of them had never touched it, and so had no idea. But also in just having communication and conversations with them, realized that they really had not gotten any guidance from their yeah. districts. And so we had them from running the gamut from it was all blocked, even teachers couldn't use it, to it was it was open for teachers, it was blocked for students, to it was just wide open, but nobody really had had any guidance. So it just really made me realize um, how important it was that as a state level, we we're providing guidance for them because they needed our guidance in order to kind of then create the guidance to share with their teachers in their schools. And so we started working on it at the end of summer, kind of putting a, putting some ideas together. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. And I mean, I, I find it very similar to that. When we do our like PD sessions, this is the most open I've ever had any group on anything new. But it requires this like real understanding of where people are coming from and the fact that there is such inconsistency of approach, but also understanding that you also you have to really take that into account. So one of the things I really like about the guidance you all have put together, I know we talked about it, it did blow out a bit, right? Because when you start get started, you realize that the foundational components that there are a lot of things that have to be included at this time. So do you mind kind of sharing your screen and we'll take like five minutes to go through you know, what you needed to be there, what you think are the highlights. And, you know, if we're going to include this as an attachment and the YouTube. Um, so if you want to look at it more directly as well, we'll have some time to do that on your own. Okay. And I think it's going to, it said that uh, you have disabled screen sharing. So you know you... what? Technology is great. You can now do it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So I will share my screen and we will just look through it real quickly. It's a very long document with a lot of words, so I'm not going to read to you. I will just kind of give you an overview. Um, first of all, um, we have a plan in North Carolina that's called the Digital Learning Plan, and that is kind of like our guiding light in DTL. So we've organized it around that. And so we've got the leadership, human capacity, curriculum assessment, data privacy and security, and then technology. And so in each section, we just have some, some features like, of course, the leadership section is mostly talking about creating guidance um, from, a, from a district standpoint and also from a school standpoint. And we've also kind of tied it in with our portrait of the graduate, which is something else that we've done in North Carolina. 
And so it talks about resi um, implementation. And then I've also bor borrowed heavily from AI for Education, which is why I kind of reached out to Amanda and said, hey, you know, I'm going to use a lot of your stuff on this and wanted to give you a heads up. But this is from your website, of course. And so it's kind of our roadmap, um, recommendations for implementing. And then we have guidelines for the school as well. And so that's pretty much all of the leadership. And then it also talks a little bit about choosing tools and evaluating them. But then on the human capacity part, which is talking about basically, you know, building that human capacity in your in your work staff and your staff. And it talks a lot about the training. And, and also we've introduced the idea of AI literacy, which, of course, is going to become more and more important. Um, another thing that we did in our recommendations is a little different from some others is um, we've included resources so that people have things they can actually take and use like. I've got your resources. I've got some of mine, like my frameworks and stuff. And so those are things that people can actually take and print or whatever to kind of build some common language and understanding across their schools or their districts. And so it's got some more of those things. Another thing from AI for Education um, in conjunction with me, the Every Framework. And then so I've included lots of those and they're not yeah. mandates, but they're resources that people can use if it helps them. Um, yeah, maybe let's highlight this one before you go too, because I love that there's so many great resources. And if you're thinking about pulling together your own guidance, I think this is a show not tell time. So even though like we can say a lot of words, like actually kind of showing people. So this is a great example um, of a piece that Vera, I know that you adapted from Leon Furz's and others work, but it's the idea of like uh, a system of knowing when you can use AI as a student. Um, so, you know, no AI use to full AI use with human oversight. And I love that you've included human in the loop, even in that full use that it's not just like here, use an agent, go do things, right? It is, are you being responsible, which is what we have that every framework that you showed briefly. So I think that if you're watching this and looking at this is that not only if you're looking for guidance yourself, but if you're building, like this is the opportunity to actually discreetly talk about practical strategies and to start to put shape where there has been none, because people really would like to see what they can use, what they can't use, where to get started. So we lower that cognitive load in this really crazy transformational time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree totally. I mean, and originally I didn't include any of these kinds of things, but it just seemed like they were going to leave with more questions than answers. So just so many opportunities to say, you know, say you should do this and here, here's an example of how. And I feel like that makes it more practical and actionable for people. And so, um, and so we also have, re you know, recommendations on citing sources. I have borrowed from Holly Clark here on the AI detectors, because that's always a question I get asked. And so it's just all strategies and I'll kind of skip ahead. So we, um, in we included several people on the committee. One was our data and privacy, a director of data and privacy. And so she had input in, you know, specific things concerning that. We also had our K-12 cybersecurity expert join us. And so he gave, you know, it, he gave us advice on how we could spell that out, the cybersecurity stuff and how to make sure that they're being careful with that. And so he also provided some information on the technology and infrastructure. And then also I wanted to make sure that we give them some, I feel like very well vetted, high quality resources that they can then take and use themselves. And so we've provided some for the school leaders, the staff development options. You'll see AI for education there again several places and then for students as well, because, you know, there's so much out there, but all of it is not the same quality and all of it's not necessarily designed for the K-12 space. And so, um, and then we of course have our resources. And so that's just a quick run through, but it is a lot of words and a lot of text, but we did include lots of those resources that people can take and use as well. Yeah, and I think that this is, there, there's a balance, right? Because I think this is a moment also in which you need to create a foundation of what these tools mean, right? And you mm -hmm. have definitions and you have, you know, time where you've talked about bias, so you've talked about hallucinations and inaccuracies. Mm -hmm. So I think like when we think about this on balance, like versus a lot of other, you know, re, uh, kind of guidance, this seems very, very practical. And so it's really exciting to see that. But if you want to come off share, you know, yeah. when we talk about like building a policy or guidelines, Sometimes it's where we stop, right? Like it's almost like the work has been done because the guidelines have been created. But you and I both know, and we like tend to agree with this, is that this is only the first step, right? The next step is like 
adoption and implementation and change management. So how are you thinking about supporting the rollout of this, this uh, guidance? Like, how are you going to ensure that it is impactful, that it is driving, you know, literacy, it's driving capacity building and effective and ethical use? Okay, well, we have uh, several different modes that we'll be sharing it out. To begin with, we're going to target leaders, um, our, our leaders in the technology arena and like superintendents, all of those will get it through the official channels. But we also have a bi-weekly call with with all the tech directors across the state. And it's really well attended. They started during COVID and they love it. So I'll be sharing that out there first this Thursday. And then we have, um, we meet four times a year with a lot of the same people. We have something called Digital Leaders Exchange and it is at the end of this month. And this this time we're focusing, we focus on one of our digital learning plan areas each time. This is human capacity. And so they'll be bringing with them their, their trainers and people from their district. And so we'll be sharing it there. Um, we're also, we'll have a couple of webinars to kind of share it out. Um, it will share it also. We have eight regional consultants in North Carolina. We have a regional support plan. And so we'll share it. All of those regional consultants already have access. They've already reviewed it. They'll be able to share it out with their regions. And generally digital teaching and learning, the department that I'm in is the one that does the most as far as like really being that connection to the schools, to the school leaders, um, to the technology. So they'll all be sharing it out. The regional directors will have it. And then we're also going to, it is a living document. Uh, we've kind of made that note, but we're going to try to keep adding to Adding to it in particular, you and I have talked a lot about the AI literacy component, and it's kind of new. There's not a lot of stuff out there. I know that AI for education is going to be expanding that down to uh, the lower grades, but we're going to be adding more to that. I was kind of giving general guidelines of what this might look like in the early grades, middle grades, and upper grades. But So we'll be adding more to that, and we also want to put together a like a Canvas course that is mm. kind of a a place that they can go on demand and, and work through it. And um, of course it will be a constant process of revisiting it, updating it and, you know, updating the folks and re resharing it out. So. That's really great. And I think that, you know, what I love about this is that you've thought about it as a change management process. You've included stakeholders, like you have your eight regional people, shout out to Stacy. you know, like, you know, we have like great people, you've got it kind of leveled up and down. And I think that as you guys are, you know, as the state, you know, continues to support the guidance, like it becomes more and more about keeping people upskilled, keeping it up to date, but just socializing it across the different components and the leadership association, like the leadership um, structure within the state, I think is a really great way to do that. And so I think that, you know, when we, we get so excited AI for education to see um, guidance where there has been none. And I think that you're going to see, and if we come back together, hopefully, you know, we come again in, you know, a couple months is that you start to see that this has trickled down into districts having guidelines and then schools having guidelines. And then from there, it's hopefully like, you know, curricular units having guidelines that are specific to that curriculum unit, you know, it's going to look different. And you talked about a K-6 area where there's no permissioning for kids that young. And so how teachers are using it or how they're modeling it potentially will be quite differently than what could happen in a ninth grade or 10th grade, 11th grade class mm -hmm. that has a research component. So we're really excited about it. Do you have any, like, do you have any shout outs to the people that made this possible? And um, I know that there are some really amazing people that that were, you know, really ensuring that this was going to happen. Yeah, well, I would like to shout out to everybody else who's on the guidelines committee because they all were part of it. Diane Delaney is our director of data and privacy. Eli Hamrick from the computer science department was an important voice in it. And actually they were kind of doing the same thing. And we found out we had started one, they had started one. So we just decided to combine our efforts and um, they liked our drafts. We went with it, but they were very good um, to have on the committee and kind of get their take. Um, Dr. Ashley McBride, is the one who kind of put the committee together. She's our section chief of digital uh, learning plan. And then Tim Weiss, I've already said, our cybersecurity expert. And then um, Dr. Vanessa Wren, our CIO, as of course, uh, nothing happens without her permission. And she is very forward thinking, um, is on the forefront. You know, she was at the White House meeting on AI and she's a, a leading voice. And so it's important that we have the leadership from the top. And so her support's been crucial. And then also we had our um, folks from Exceptional Children just kind of look over and review to make sure that that voice was included. So we want to make sure that 
you know, it, it is inclusive of everyone and, and there'll be more guidelines coming more specific on that a little later. But so all of those people were, were instrumental. And of course, all of the people in the field that I've trained, you've kind of, I've given, they've given me informal poll information on what's going on in the districts and how they're using it. And that's been important information, even though it wasn't an official survey. Yeah, <laughs> well, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, also, I think we have to say thank you to you because like without your like guidance and like belief in this, and this is what we see over and over again. If you, if you're an early adopter, if you're someone that believes in the importance of this moment in time and ensuring that education is not left behind in this transformational cycle, you really can make a huge difference. And Vera, you're an example of that. And of course you are working with a lot of people, but you know, as you said, someone else was doing the same thing. You were, you know, you came together, but without your kind of want and, and your ability to see around that corner of this need for guidance, mm -hmm. it would be very hard to get through. And I know it took you, you know, it's working with committee and it takes a bit of time. And I'm sure you wanted this out, like, you know, five months ago when you started, but I think that this is a great example of that. I just a call to action. If you're watching this, if you're at a district, if you're at a state, if you're at a, you know, higher education institution, sometimes it's just, you just got to get started. And then if you have that buy-in, you could do really remarkable things. And the best thing is it doesn't have to be perfect. This moment in time, nothing is perfect. So a, a really strong evidence-based draft is going to be enough for that starting place of building a strategic roadmap, an adoption plan, and a change management plan. So I just want to say thank you to you, Vera. You've been a, such a good, um, you know, you've been a, a fount of great knowledge and new resources, but you also have made a huge difference in North Carolina. So I just want to say thank you. Well, thank you. And I also want to give a shout out to your to your company, AI for Education. You know, I've told you this before, but I'll tell everybody else now. It's been it's been really important in my learning over the last year because they're just especially a few months ago, there just wasn't a lot out there that was practical and that was education and uh, education related. So I really appreciate all of the information there. And anybody who hasn't explored the website, there's a wealth of resources there to help kind of guide you in your journey. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. So, okay. So I think the draft is off and it's going to be fully released this week. Um, if you're interested in following up, um, Vera, what's your, are you comfortable with your email address or LinkedIn um, being yeah, shared? Either, either one is fine. Um, my email address is on the bottom of the document, um, vera.cubero vera at dpi.nc.gov. And on LinkedIn, I'm just Vera Cabero. So easy to find. <laughs> So say hello. Uh, and then, like we said, so if you're thinking about this, great to reach out. But I just want to say thank you to Vera. I want to say thank you for everyone pulling this together. And happy reading, everybody. Thank you, everyone.